Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Before I introduce our guest for today, please go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter of the show and get cool merchandise and help keep this show going for all the people who listen and all the people in the future who will be benefiting from it. Again, patreon.com slash indoctrination. And another thing before I introduce the speaker, it is true, as I said last time, that people are listening all over the world, which is so wonderful and so exciting. And we have quite a presence in the United States, but also Canada and Australia, Russia, Denmark, Finland, Lithuania, and Uruguay, which is very cool. And I also have heard from a couple people from other parts of the world and have gotten into great dialogues with people, namely someone who is who might be listening, and hello to you, um, contacting me from Romania. And it is wonderful because it shows that we're all connected and we have similar interests and similar needs. And these kinds of issues affect us for different reasons. But I would love to hear from you about why it speaks to you and to let me know, too, if there's something happening in your part of the world that really is an issue of indoctrination or a system of control that you might want to talk about. Just be in touch. And so for today, we have Spike Robinson. Spike is somebody who I've known for many years. We always have very entertaining conversations and she's great. She does a lot of really good work and is quite devoted to the cause of educating people about coercive persuasion and manipulation. So here's a little bio, a little introduction for K, quote unquote, Spike Robinson. Born in the wilds of New Jersey and raised in bustling metropolitan Vermont, Kay Spike Robinson began her educational career in literary criticism before deciding to go for broke, literally, and study music theory and composition. One completed degree and three years in a quote-unquote ritual magic cult later, she found a new life path educating others about coercive control, manipulation, persuasion, and the many nefarious ways that predator people fool us into acting against our own best interest. It's a really important line. Hang on to it. That theme will be woven into her episode in many ways. She currently manages the YouTube channel of author John Atak, also a wonderful person and a previous guest on this show, and lives with her ever patient husband and her birds. Here's Spike now. I am so happy to have the wonderful Spike Robinson with me today. We've just spoken a couple times, but you are so smart and funny, and I appreciate both, and also multi-talented with being a, a graphic artist and a musician and doing good work on this planet. So I want you to be able to take a moment, introduce yourself, and then we'll get started with you telling your story. I am a graphic artist and also musician, composer, singer, songwriter. And since about 2015 or so, personal assistant, to author John A. Tack and actively working to educate people about cults, destructive groups, abusive relationships, coercive control, and all of that. Basically, I feel it's my duty, having been through a very small sample of how bad it can get, that I want to do make sure that this is taught in schools in my ideal world. So Okay, so I want you to be able to talk a little bit about your history. I know that you have a significant story to share about 
your mind altering experiences just to show who you were leading up to that moment and maybe what made you a seeker of that sort? All of our actions lead to where we are today. I was always a seeker. I was always what some people would call spiritual. When I was a small child, I would wander through the woods and I'm here in Vermont where I grew up and the woods in here in Vermont are just enchanting. They're beautiful. There's all sorts of little critters, light little paths, nice old growth woods. And I would wander through and I swear I would sing to the fairies. Every twig I picked up was a magic wand. Every dang stone I found on the beach was a magic talisman. I don't know if you've ever seen the rocks on our beaches in Vermont. They're usually dark, dark stone with striated quartz and bizarre patterns. So it was very easy to go there. I mean, I was raised though into a household of a born again atheist and a devout agnostic. They did their best as parents, but they totally denied anything that wasn't seen. So they didn't know what to make of this kid who once tromped in the house saying, look, mom, somebody who you don't believe in is making it snow. And so I was always very, very into finding what was out there, what was beyond. Got my first tarot deck and looked through it and I was always trying to find out what it was. And I always felt a very very close relationship, not with the particular God of any religion, because I had no, absolutely no religious education whatsoever. But I did feel that there was something beyond all of us, something bigger than all of us. And I felt a very close kinship to that, particularly to water, which will come in later on, because Lake Champlain is, frankly, one of the most beautiful lakes. I have been to Lake Geneva. I have been to many other lakes in the world, but Lake Champlain is gorgeous. And for a while, I felt that my spirituality was wrapped up with my relationship to water. And that comes in later on. I'm noticing or noting some themes. So here, being open to other kinds of things being around us that we can't see and not feeling alone. You know, you're in the woods on your own, uh, but not on your own. And so there's something about, I think, that feeling of connection and also having power. If a stick was a magic wand, there's a reason, right? You wanted to be able to do something, create something, protect something, whatever it was. So I'm just wondering about that feeling, the need to connect and the need to have some kind of special ability. There's also the need to go somewhere else. As soon as I read Narnia, as soon as I read all of the Narnia books, every door in every strange farmhouse, you know, you go to the farmer's co-op and leave the parents to checking out the wheat germ and go and look and see where the basement goes and where this door is. And I was always into exploring strange things. And I was never alone in the woods. There's chipmunks, there's squirrels, there's foxes, there's all kinds of birds. And I've always felt that these, even though, yes, I am not a vegan, I am not a vegetarian, but I also have a very deep connection to any little beastie that comes along. I, to this day, I feed chipmunks out on my back porch. So, but there was also the idea of magic and going somewhere else and also a deep sense of having to have a purpose in the world. To these days, now I keep it very, I keep whatever my sense of divine is explicitly nebulous so that I do not define it. I purposefully don't define it my divinity. But I still feel that everybody should have a sense of purpose in the world. For mine, I feel that if I'm not making my community better through a job, then I shouldn't be in that job. Right. Okay. Well, I can relate to that. Yeah. It's a sense of purpose, sort of. I've always felt that from a very small child, I needed to have a purpose. Now it's not the deep purpose with a capital P that I thought it was when I was a child. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. I was the type of child that spelled everything in capital letters and everything was deep. Everything meant something, which can lead to some very dangerous places if you are not careful. So what happened was I lived at home all the way till I graduated from the University of Vermont. 
And then I went away to graduate school at University of Bowling, State University of Bowling Green, the College of Music for a master's degree in composition. Uh, in the second year, I became involved with and got engaged to an, another composition student. And the I'm sure every woman and possibly some of the men will relate to this. The clingier I got, the more withdrawn he became. And then when he left, I basically stopped doing everything. I did not apply for doctoral schools. I only incorrectly replied, didn't send transcripts. I mean, it was almost like I was planning to fail and indeed did not get into doctoral school. At the time, I was working in the kitchen at a nursing home. And then one summer night, it was actually, at first, I've got to bring in the summer afternoon, the KKK was coming to Toledo for a march. I remember that. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. That made big news you know, within the Jewish community. We try to follow that as much as possible. Oh, okay, of yeah. course, of course. Uh -huh. Well, okay, for that march, I was sitting in my regular coffee, which uh, in Bowling Green, Ohio, is about 20 miles south of Toledo as the crow flies. And there was this young man who was, he wasn't speaking, he never spoke. He always declaimed, he announced. And he was telling everybody with an earshot, but most specifically the poor soul sitting opposite of the table, that he was going to sick Mother Kali on the KKK people and make them burn under their robes. And I thought, cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to back you up because this is still the one thing that I cannot figure out out of all of this is that at some point at the work in Ohio, I put up end of the world and I put up, I forget what the date was. Let's call it July 10th, 1993 or something. Put it on a piece of paper, stuck it on the bulletin board. I just moved to the activities department now from the kitchen. Now I was singing to little old ladies for, for a living. And so now fast forward a couple of years from that to the coffee shop and the KKK, you know, him talking about the KKK. And then about a week later, I'm playing solitaire with my tarot deck, which was something I always did in the coffee shop. I don't know why, but I did. And the same guy sits down and says, are you reading the tarot? And I said, well, I don't really know how to read it. Uh, I can teach you how to do that. And I don't know, there was something about him stringy black hair, big nose, always wearing a variety of those fake silver rings that you get in the back of Spencer's, you know, skulls and black stones, and, you know, and every single one I would learn had a some sort of portentous meaning to it. And we talked literally all night. The coffee shop closed. We walked to the pizza joint. The pizza joint closed. We walked to his dorm room. And it wasn't like walking to a guy's dorm room to fool around. It was like walking to a guy's dorm room to talk to him more about this deep stuff. And I can't even remember a lot of the stuff that was said that night, except that the upshot was, you're my spirit sister. I recognize you. We're destined for great things together. And you and I shall form this movement that shall take care of the world after the great cataclysm. Oh, and the great cataclysm. Interesting. So that's a recurring oh, yeah. theme, right? And there's always a that used as a motivator. After I got out, I was so shocked to find out just how freaking textbook all of my experiences were from the being jilted to the cataclysm to the love bombing that started but so that first night he did something that he called astral projection but now I know as guided imagination he basically sat me down in a chair and we went on a tour of the solar system and the silver lodge and the red lodge and Atlantis where I was hailed as the queen because he said, you are the queen of Atlantis. You are the woman who shall be married to, it was either Poseidon or Neptune, and they were interchangeable. So my love of water was immediately taken. And, and which would you rather be? A dropout of a master's degree program with a dead-end job 
kind of split away from her family, nowhere to go, working for minimum wage, just not even living anymore. Or the queen of Atlantis who shall help Atlantis rise and and at the great cataclysm take over a great university where we would study magic as well as physics and bind the two together. Right. I mean, this is you're walking through the woods and the beaches and the magical thinking and the wonderment and having it be so special and goosebumpy, basically. But it ties so unfortunately beautifully in. It does. He could really tell a tale. And so what happened, you know, when you're talking about all these stories being told about you, it sounds like then there was not only the the narrative, but certain action steps that you needed to take. I mean, what did you do as part of this? Well, most of the time we talked and it was only later when people joined us, we would go on road trips and visit bookstores and get stuff. It was, but it was always very conversational so that a couple people would join us and one would leave because they didn't like it. At one point I was sitting in the coffee shop and a gal who was, what should we call him? Let's, I don't want to use his real name. We'll call him Jack. Okay. And I knew her. she was a friend of Jack and we sat down and we had a bit of a cup of coffee. And as soon as he came in, she left. Now, bookmark that because it was and and then he was saying, "Okay, we've got to do this. We've got a couple new people coming in. And it was basically reading poetry. We played rounds of uh, various role playing games, you know, tabletop role playing games. It was all pretty innocuous at the start. But one thing I did notice was the story was getting darker and darker and darker and darker. I started off as this angel of light that would stand on on Jack's one side and a demon would stand on his other and it would balance out the force and all of that. And that demon would also be the incarnation of my husband, Neptune, Poseidon, whatever. So now fast forward about a half year and I'm cleaning off my bulletin board and I just had an argument with one of my last friends from graduate school. He was saying, you know, Jack's really strange. You really shouldn't be hanging out. We're just reading poetry at each other and telling each other stories. And I didn't dare tell him we are really believing in these stories and that we had about a click of about three or four people around us at that point. Oh, interesting. Okay. Then you're cleaning off your bulletin board where you had put... Where I put that note. And I had just had an argument with my friend, stay away from Jack. And I said to myself, and I found the note and it was that day's date. Ooh, wow. That's why this is the one thing I can never, ever, ever understand. It's like, oh, I understand the coincidences happen and I'm willing to write it off as that. But if there is an afterlife, you got to bet I'm going to ask about that. Yeah. My logical brain goes into explaining away why that happened on that day and that you had remembered that date, but subconsciously. And then when you saw it was that date, you who knows what? But I also understand it was very meaningful in the moment. It was very, very meaningful at that time. And yeah, I'm willing to. I'm a rationalist now. I really am. But that date, and so I said to myself, okay, I'm going to go to the coffee shop. If my friend who warned me off Jack shows up first, then I'll go back and I'll be my little old mundane self. We'd already created that name. Mundane was everybody who wasn't magical. There were the mundanes and then there were us. So, of course, once again, the out group and the in group. And if Jack shows up first, I'll throw away the normal world and step into this wholeheartedly. So guess who shows up first? Jack. Mm. When you were saying that you were seeing things as signs and Jack was seeing things as signs. Like if you went back to the place and Jack was the first one to come in, that would be this pivotal watershed moment somehow, even though it was probably just coincidence, coincidence, whatever probability, whatever it is, but it took on a meaning and it was going to shift your life in some major way. Yeah. Yeah. But pretty soon we had a group of about seven of us. I was usually the only woman. Any other woman who got into the group usually left very pissed afterwards. 
because of the ongoing, well, it was basically, you know, it was not a, it was not a healthy place for women, except for Lisa. Lisa and me, we were the only two. She was then Jack's wife. And he was heavily into, I don't think it was into BDSM as a lifestyle because I've since met people who are BDSM that don't use it as an abuse, but he was using it as an abuse. Oh no. Oh, yeah. sorry. He was using it as an abuse for her. And he would have times where he'd call us all into town. I lived a couple miles out of town. So we all had to go to his dorm room to be told that we had all betrayed him in dream. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'd all betrayed him in dream on the astral plane. So everything basically happened on the astral plane. So basically we're just sitting around in armchairs with our, our eyes closed while he describes to us what goes on. And then he would also speak to spirits that weren't there. So he'd say, Oh, Mercury's talking to me and he's saying, you just betrayed me. Or this spirit here just came into my head and says that you have to buy me that book. I was the only one with any money. So it was usually me. Okay. The thing that is really fascinating about the sudden accusation that you had all betrayed him. I mean, for someone who is trying to control other people and is trying to make sure that they can get things out of them. That is probably the most successful way because then you feel uh, you owe him something. You have to pay back for it. You're indebted and he's going to maybe try to forgive you, but you probably have to pay penance in some way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as a nice person that I have always been, when somebody's angry, my first response is to make it better immediately. Even today, if somebody bumps into me, you know, I'll, I'll apologize first because that's my first reaction is that I must have done something, so I must apologize. So he scooped that up and used that. Then there was another time I remember he told us that in a future lifetime, Eddie had raped somebody. And because I was his wife, both of us could possibly be, quote unquote, erased. That is, never have existed at all, ever. Wow erased. So we spent an agonizing two hours in the coffee shop while we had to watch Jack talking back and forth with this woman in a future timeline, telling her, okay, now go make a sword, now make it thinner, because for some reason making a sword was going to cure her or something. Not sure how. A lot of it was so freaking random. A lot of it was also bits and pieces of TV shows. He'd call us up and say, there's some mail. And well, what mail is it? It's this old movie. And we have to sit down and watch the movie. And he would assign each of us a character in that movie. And then we had to be, we had to take the punishment or the rewards that that character deserved for those actions in that movie. Okay, so I'm now remembering many years ago, I went to something at a, at a local university, you know, with being a therapist, you're supposed to get continuing education credits. And so they had this workshop at a university near me, and it was all about other modalities dealing with trauma and past trauma. And, you know, I thought it would be helpful. It turns out the modalities were things that I didn't necessarily believe in that were a little shady and not necessarily proven in any sort of scientific realm, but not necessarily harmful. But then I went on purpose because of the work that I do. I went on purpose to this workshop given by someone who does past life regression. So I'm sitting there and this woman sits down next to me and she looks very regal. She's wearing this huge white scarf that she throws over her shoulder. It swats me in the face <laughs> and, and she didn't care. And so the man then says, and now I want it, the man who's giving the workshop, I want to introduce one of my clients or my students to you. And he points to the woman who sat down next to me. He said, I want to introduce you to Marie Antoinette. <laughs> but I thought how interesting that she now was embodying this character. And the way he came to believe this was that he threw measurements of her head, which is always freaking me out because it reminds me of Nazis, uh, which is always problematic. But 
<laughs> it was very hard for me to not laugh. And she's sitting right next to me. So I really held it in. But also because she was often suffering from neck pain. Oh, gosh. So she must have been Marie Antoinette. Now, what I always find interesting, though, is with people who, and it's fine, if you believe that you are reincarnated, fine. It's just that this man was getting a lot of money and time out of her, right? And I don't know how this was helping her in her life. When it was done, she stood at the doorway waiting for people to open the door for her because she's not going to touch a door because she's Marie Antoinette. Is that really helping her get along in the world? So I was, I was bothered by that. And she was a university student. And, and I know a lot of people will think, oh, you know, that it's about gullibility, but it's so much about conditioning and the relationship and your history. And it's so many other factors. Oh, yeah. It's nothing about intelligence. It's all about emotional and it's all not even about emotional neediness. It's about when you were taken. I was taken at a very low point, vulnerable point in my life when I really needed something. And also I just heard something that resonated pretty darn deeply. Somewhere around that point, we were uh, made to take the Oath of the Abyss, which basically says, I vow to interpret everything as an act of the divine and a message for me in particular. And why was it called the Abyss? Oh, because we were going to cross the abyss. We were Crowleyan in flavor. Okay. So the abyss is when you go from the neophyte levels to the advanced ones. You cross the abyss between, you're, you're familiar with the Kabbalah, I'm sure. And yeah. those who aren't, look it up. Oh, it's intense and head spinning. It is very, very, very intense. And I mean, I did all sorts of work with it, even had Kabbalistic reinterpretation of the tarot pips and everything. But uh, I loved it because I used to do all sorts of little mathematical things with, I'd take, take, say, a rose and I'd turn it into a magical system or a unicorn or a dolphin into, a, and he would say, no, you can't do that. That's throwing the universe out of balance. Because I went on these little explorations of, they weren't even so much magic as they were magic flavored psychology, if you know what I mean. Yeah, interesting. Because to me now, the way I practice tarot is not that there's any other magic than just basically looking at the cards, creating a story with the cards, because each card has a little event, shuffling them around, creating a story, and then using that story to interpret the mess that's going around in your brain and bring some order out of the chaos, but no magic. And so for me, tarot is psychosocial thematic apperception. That's basically all it is. Mm -hmm. Nicely said. And for the viewers at home, thematic apperception is when they show you a picture of something and you have to write a little story about it. Very interesting. So how did you move away from this? That's the thing is that I didn't move away from it all at once. Because we then, we gathered a whole bunch of people now, and we, we went on a nightmare of a camping trip, which I was given acid and made to kneel and told that now I was not this person, I was now this person, and I was now a robot that had been constructed. My spirit was supposedly ripped out of my body, thrown away. I was now this robot constructed inside this body to do the bidding because I had failed. So I needed to be a new person. Oh, okay. And, you know, I mean, if you've ever taken acid, you know that whatever you're being told at that time is not only just true, but true with all the big bigness. Put that all in caps and in neon lights. And then I had to drive everybody home afterwards because I was the only one with a driver's license. But we won't get into that. Coming down for my first acid trip. And driving. And driving, and also without my glasses, which I am required to drive with, but we're soon taken away. Now, you don't need those because you only, you know, that you just think you do. Yeah, the blindness of my left eye is psychosomatic. Yeah, right. I could go on and on about the individual little things that stick with me, like the time that one of our guys, who was the incarnation of the god of pain, decided that he wanted to do a ritual of pain. And since I was the good one, I didn't get to see it. But when he came back from that ritual, he was a bloody mess. Oh, no. They kicked him and kicked him and kicked him and kicked him and kicked him. 
but it was because he was the god of pain and he had to experience himself. Oh, that's awful. Oh, that was awful. It was freaky. And also at this point, I had about four of them living in my house or my apartment that I was keeping them and I was buying everything on my minimum wage salary. I still don't know how I did it. So people listening are probably going to ask the inevitable question, which is even after it was getting darker and darker and darker, as you're saying, and this person comes back bloodied and you need to drive on acid and they take away your glasses, et cetera, et cetera. Why did I stay? Because I believed it. Because I believed that if I didn't, I would be worse than dead. I would have never existed. Also, I would have betrayed the group and also condemned the universe to a horrible, horrible, horrible fate. Because if we didn't go properly through the cataclysm, the earth would be burned to a cinder. I have now since seen why abused women leave their spouses at least seven times as the standard. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, sometimes it did occur to me. And when it finally did, what happened was the nursing home that I was working for lost their license to educate their nurses' aides. Usually what happens when you're in a nursing home, you get the CNA course while you're working at the nursing home, and then you can become a fully certified nursing assistant. However, if a nursing home is run badly enough, they will take that away from you, and you can't train your CNAs there. So they had to cut budget, and so they looked to the activities department, of course, and they cut half of our jobs. And even though I was the one of the ones who would have kept my job, it would not have been enough to keep four people in a house. So I said, I'll go home because then I thought I can convince them we were supposed to go to Boston at some point, which is what, three, four hours drive from Burlington. I lied and said it was only two hours from Burlington. <laughs> Because even then, there was a tiny bit of me that didn't believe and was looking for a way out. There was always that tiny little thing, but I usually pushed that aside as far as possible. But at this point, I just said, okay, fine. And I'll take Eddie and we'll go to Burlington. And he came along with me and he was put in charge of me, even though he was abusive. And I said, wouldn't that make a problem? Only if you make it a problem. Oh, it's on you to make sure that he doesn't abuse you. Yeah, because actually what it was, was that I was such a strong Scorpio that he was unable to deal with arguing with me on an intellectual level. So he used his fists when I got to me. Uh, you hear about the archetype, the female archetypes, and also how it gives permission for people to feel that they can mistreat these people. Uh, it's like the sirens, right? Like they're somehow putting this spell on you and they have this power over you and you can't then be held responsible for what you're doing. But that's a, it's a new one about being a Scorpio. But anyway, same idea. So um, my mom, even though we hadn't been very, on very good terms, was delighted to me coming home. My grandfather had died the year before and I had come to the funeral and not even cried because he was just a construct. Uh, wow. He was just a construct, so he didn't exist anyway. So my mom did exist, though, in the theology for some reason. She was a forgotten sister because for everything, we've always been rather attached anyway. It's, you know, we've always had this rather, well, mother and daughter, for God's sakes. Any case, so she bought me the condo that I'm in with the inheritance from my grandfather and uh, he came after a while, as soon as I got a job, and I was able to get a job at a nursing home during inactivities of one of our lovely local nursing homes. And he came and he got a succession of jobs that he kept on quitting because the energies were wrong. Finally, a neighbor called the police during one of his rages. And my mom found out about it and said, he's leaving. And of course, I had to still then find money for him to live somewhere else. I had to find money. And, um, you know, I was taking out money out of my bank account to give him, go into Burlington and find him place after place where he basically couch surfed. This is the one I mean, what, that the listeners are going, what is this woman? She must be a total idiot. But it's very worth as an illustration of just how far belief can go. I had come to see him 
And we were in City Hall Park in Burlington. And anybody who's been in Burlington knows City Hall Park. It's this beautiful little nook behind the City Hall. And he said, you were not supposed to be here. The spirits did not give you permission. And he was shouting at me and screaming. And I was going, oh, please, I just wanted to see you. He pushed me down right there. And a couple of really brutish guys saw this guy pushing a gal down in City Hall Park. So they come up and they go, come on, why don't you pick on someone your own size or various words to that effect. And I took my soda bottle and I broke it on the railing and I stood between them and him and said, you will not harm him. Wow. Now, current Spike is like, what the hell? Step back and tell him to have at it. But at the same time, I know exactly what belief does and also what love does. I was convinced I was in love with this loser. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And I finally told him no, because once he moved out, I was able to have time to myself. And some of the people at my car, at the work that I was in were reaching out to me and I was starting to see how real people reacted. Okay. Interesting. Then finally, just about a little while after I finally said goodbye to them, I met a wonderful guy in the back of the Unitarian Church. Now, Burlington, Vermont, the Unitarian Church is Unitarian Universalist. They're the ones that Jewish, Buddhist, whatever, atheist, you're welcome. Come sit in the same pew and sing nice songs with all the words changed so they don't can't possibly insult anybody. I met this wonderful man and he came over and we sang and I fell in love with him. And 25 years later, we've been married for 21 years. Wow, that was quite beautiful. Yeah, after meeting him, I tried to find a counselor to find out what the hell had happened. I could not get anybody. They were, I mean, the one counselor, she was like, well, let's look at look at your family and what your family did to you. I said, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting too. But no, this is a totally different experience. That has nothing to do. I knew that much, that it wasn't my family that had driven me into this. It was my low point. But so I started doing my things. And then at this new boyfriend's house, and I'll give his name, his name's Wally. At his house, I got my first email account because this is baby internet time, 1997 or so, back in the old bulletin board times. And I found alt.scientology.religion on the talks for talks for ex-cult members. And they were the people that told me what had happened to me. They're the ones who recommended me Steve's book, Combating Cult Mind Control. They're the ones who taught me about all what, a lot of the guilt induction, phobia induction. They told me about, you know, disconnection and all of that. And I became fascinated. And I've always been a bookish girl anyway. So I started reading as many stories as possible. The first one was Mark Headley's, then Nancy Manny's extremely excellent My Billion Year Contract, which you want to talk about how crazy faith can make you you know and she is an excellent woman i mean she is wonderful wonderful kind saintly woman she had a psychotic break before leaving while leaving scientology i mean this this stuff can f you up seriously so it was the ex-scientologists and i started going through and reading this and watching Scientology. And even during my cult years, in fact, here's one thing that is another little piece is that back in Ohio, it was when the when the Lisa McPherson thing broke. Oh, right. So yeah, the whole Lisa McPherson case that people can look that up if they haven't heard about it. She died while under quote unquote care. Of Scientology's, yeah. And Mike Rinder was defending the church at the time because he was still in. And I looked at him and in the back, Jack was saying, well, Scientologists are right, but for the wrong reasons. Okay. Even when I was in the depths of the group, there would be these moments of clarity. And one of them came to me while I was watching Mike defend the indefensible. And I looked in his eyes and I just thought, he's not doing this of his free will. They've got people that he loves somehow in captivity. He's in captivity. And I thought, oh my God, he is as much a captive as I am. 
Oh, interesting. Right. And for people who don't know, he was the spokesman for Scientology for many years. Very intimidating at the time. I remember speaking at conferences where he was in attendance and he would be there just to give people a hard time and get into their faces. And he was good at it. And then at the time, he looked really like a mob boss. Now he softened up a bit. And I've actually had the honor of communicating with him as part of my job for John Atack, <laughs> you know, and then setting up things where John and Mike talk. So it's amazing. So I went through with my little life. I got married to Wally and I kept watching Scientology and I was looking for stuff to listen to when I landed on Tori Crispin's channel. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Tori Magoo. Uh huh. Oh, she is such a blessed woman. I love her. I've, I've had the honor to meet her now. Yes. Yeah, and great. I listened to her entire story of how she escaped from Scientology and was literally chased across the country oh, yeah. by Scientologists. Go and listen to it. It is freaking amazing. You know, that I don't pray. I do keep whatever concept I have of divinity as a very nebulous object. But at that day, I did pray and I said, please, let me earn my bread and wine by helping people avoid this kind of bullshit. And I wrote to Tori, and she introduced me to Pete Griffiths, who's a wonderful guy over in England, who was, who was the top SP in England. And he introduced me to John Atack. And John Atack just happened to be looking for an assistant. And for me, that was like a rock and roll fan getting a job as, as the Beatles driver. And we ran the, in 2015, we ran the Getting Clear conference together where I met the whole crew of folks, Chris Shelton, Tori Christman, Tony Ortega. And I want to say for any ex-Scientologist listening, you guys are my tribe. Yes. And for people listening too, so it's interesting. You mentioned all these people. They've been on the show. So Tori, Tori and I have known each other a long time. We've worked on some cases together. She's fantastic. And her story is amazing. And the fact that she's so joyful, I don't know how she does it after what she's been through. And Tony Ortega has been on and John Atek and a number of other people there. They, they deal with a lot of harassment and they deal with a lot of uh pushback just to be able to get the word out and warn people and to protect people. I am so grateful that you are assisting with all of that. And I got to meet Steve Hassan. I have helped him with his most recent book, Tr Cult of Trump. I was the one who did the little graphics for him. Oh, you did. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah cool. So it's like, wow. I mean, he, his book literally saved my life. Oh. And then I get to meet him some years later and he gives me a big hug. <laughs> Chris so Shelton cool. greeted me like a sister. I still feel he's 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 now the new brother, you know. <laughs> Love it. So, I just as we're finishing up, I think, you know, when we talk about, I mean, the name of the show is indoctrination. Certainly you highlighted really well how people get indoctrinated and how you got indoctrinated. And just to add if there's another point about that that you want to be able to make before we finish up. I think the best thing a person can do is read up about the Lifton criteria for thought reform, the eight deadly sins, as it were, read Steve's book, read a lot of things, go to the survivor groups on Facebook, but don't get too involved in them because sometimes they can get a little, uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, Facebook groups can do that anyway. Facebook can be vicious sometimes. Mm, okay. Yeah, but at the same time, there's always help out there. You are wonderful. I, I've, I've actually been referring quite a few people to you over the years. Oh, thank you. You're good at this stuff. And I mean, because anybody, it's that my story is bizarre. It's fantastic. It's gruesome. And yet it happened. And... I'm not a dummy. I mean, my God, I came out of it from a master's degree. I was being groomed to be a college professor. Yeah. No, I mean, you're a great example for people. If, you know, you fly in the face of the stereotype. And I'm sorry that there is that kind of stereotype. Well, Scientology had NASA physicists. Heaven's Gate, where they all killed themselves. They were all computer programmers and engineers. Om Shinrikyo had heart surgeons. And the list goes on and on and on. Wasn't Rajneeshi called the called the PhD cult too? Yeah, right. Yeah. 
so that it's not intelligence. It is, in fact, I tend to think that it's the people who are more imaginative, altruistic, because it's that you want to save the world thing. You've got that you want to save the world bug. We've got a cult for you. <laughs> Come on down. Uh, OK, well, Spike, thank you for going back into your history and telling your story. I know it might not be an easy thing to do to relive all of that. So. I wish you well, and I hope to talk to you again and say hi to Wally and to your birds and your chipmunks. Yes, I have. I, I'm currently training up three chipmunks, <laughs> and I have two parakeets. Beautiful. So you have your your woodland creatures, and they actually exist. They actually exist. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Good to speak with you. Thank you again. One more thing before you go. Thank you so much to Spike, my friend and colleague, who cares so deeply about educating the public about the issues that are connected with being manipulated and being coerced. And I think, you know, hearing her speak, it becomes very clear that this is not at all any kind of indicator of intelligence. She is one of the brightest women I know. So Spike really highlights for us how this has nothing to do with intelligence because she's one of the smartest women I have ever met. What it does talk about is people's different levels of susceptibility based on how open they are to different ideas. And I think people who have an idealized sense of how things could be or should be, people who like thinking about things in a fanciful way. I mean, none of these things are bad things, but they can be tapped into by someone who can try to match those stories and make them even greater and then kind of bring you under their spell and can also make you feel like your life can be good and it can make sense or that you somehow speak the same language as this person and in a way that you didn't speak with other people. And then when you have that kind of connection, then you can end up really accepting being treated in a way that you never thought that you would accept being treated. When someone you think is offering you something special and unique or you feel specially chosen, people tend to tolerate more than they should. They will also sometimes accept the explanation that it's somehow something they deserve or it's for their benefit in some way. One of the things that Spike said a lot that a lot of other people say, which is, you know, that that idea of when they say things out loud, things that they believed, they have this moment of reflection and they will say either after the fact I can't believe I believed that. Or even before they say it, they have enough awareness now and enough distance to say, okay, what I'm about to say is going to sound crazy, but I believed it at the time. We can come to believe a lot of things that other people would deem as crazy. And what's happening now, I think a lot in the world, is that a lot of people are getting involved in ideas and following ideas that other people deem as crazy. It's caused a lot of division and a lot of worry with the people who say, how come I, I'm dealing with having a loved one who's seeing things that aren't there and who are believing things that are not able to be proven and haven't or have been disproven, but they're still believing it. When you see people losing touch with reality, it is very troubling. It's something that I help a lot of families with. If you're dealing with that kind of issue, let me know. Give me a call. Send me an email. We will talk that through. See if we can help your loved one kind of land back on earth. The other thing, though, that I want to make sure to mention is to go back to this idea of being made to suffer. When you look at these people who make other people suffer in order for them to be kept in their place, and that you might tolerate that suffering because you, again, feel like that's just part of it. Or 
you want to give this other person some sort of latitude and acceptance that they sometimes fly off the handle and they say things they don't mean and they behave in ways that they really don't mean. It's really important, though, to notice if you are bruised anywhere on your body, if you are bruised psychologically, then you don't want to give the other person permission and allowance to do it. You also don't want to ever accept their justification of it because it is a dangerous situation and it is something you need to be able to break free from. There is something that I remember hearing about because I was raised in a Jewish environment and uh, my rabbi, Rabbi Shulweis, I remember him saying the following, fear not of suffering, but of suffering for no cause. I thought that was brilliant. He said a lot of brilliant things. And there have been a lot of people who have said those kinds of things too. If you're going to be suffering, life just makes you suffer. There are things in our world that are sad, things that are tragic, illnesses, losses, things that are truly unfair, things being taken away from people, people being deported, people suddenly getting a scary diagnosis. I mean, there's real suffering. But within these kinds of groups and within these kinds of relationships, you end up suffering for no reason, for no cause. And so sit back and think, is this helping me? Is this helping the world in some way? And is this actually instead giving another person permission to be a monster, to do things that they shouldn't do? Is it giving them permission to behave with me in a way that shows they have no conscience. And I don't want to give them that anymore. I don't want to gift them my trust. I don't want to gift them my loyalty. As soon as they cross that line, they no longer deserved it. It's a message I really want you to hold on to. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at indoctrination podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website, at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.